So for my next session, I'm very excited about this session because we've been talking a lot about virtual and hybrid, lots and lots of blue sky thinking and lots of discussion around the topic. Now we're going to actually have a case study um, of a hybrid case study. Um, Rich, I'm handing over to you, Rich Belcher from First Light Media. Now, congratulations on your award. Thank you very much. What award did you win? We won silver on the People's Choice that's, just that's yesterday it eve. It was lovely. Yes, and yeah. how, how are you feeling today? Yeah, actually, celebrating? actually all right. Oh, good. Yeah, the amazing. main celebrations involved a steakhouse, which was amazing. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's yeah, great. That's good. really good. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon, I think we're at now, just. Um, so, um, hi to everyone um, here and everyone watching at home, hello. Um, so um, I'm Rich Belcher from First Side Media, as uh, Katie said, um, and we're going to try and look at what um, uh, Beaver Congress 2021 looked like back in September. Um, I'm joined by a very esteemed panel of experts from Beaver, um, but before we get into that, I thought I would show you what we did rather than try to explain it. So um, here is past me, a much younger and more handsome fellow. Um, and with the genius of Internet Clicker, hopefully, if I just do this, it will play. No. Great. Thanks for that. OK, so I'll stand up and do it instead. Thanks, Internet Clicker. Um, OK, ready? Let's try that again. Good afternoon, Event Tech Live, and welcome to the first ever hybrid Beaver Congress. <laughs> I'm David Mountford, I'm Chief Executive of the British Equine Veterinary Association, Beaver. We run an annual congress. In normal times, we'd have about 2,000 delegates, we'd have about 120 ex exhibitors in a commercial exhibition. Uh, this year has been completely different. I'm Rich Belcher for First Sight Media, and I'm going to give you an insight into how we're helping the Beaver team produce this glorious event, both online and in person. So at the beginning of this year, we had to make a tough decision as to whether we were going to cancel our Congress or whether we were going to try and put something on for our membership. Working with the Beaver team, we were trying to create a solution that integrated both the online audience and the physical. Challenges for us really were around not knowing what the future held, but then also we had the issue of international guests. We typically have about 50 of our 150 speakers and a third of our delegates coming from outside of the UK. To enable the switch from in-person to hybrid, we've built three studios, one in each of the halls delivering presentations. Virtual speakers are able to dial in and present live, including being able to advance their own slides and present as if they were in the room. Each of our studios in their halls are then beamed back to this our studio in the exhibition hall. From here, we are streaming live to delegates through the platform and through the app. In addition, we're creating bonus content only available on the platform. What this meant is there's a constant stream all day from 8.30 till 6 o'clock at night, all of which is made available on demand. So the main benefit of this studio space, which we've created here in the exhibition hall, we're right in the thick of it. Everyone can see what's happening. And there are people buzzing around. There are people watching what's going on. And we invited guests onto this for discussions on, on topics perhaps that were covered in lectures, but also topical issues. And hopefully, or we intended that to enable those who weren't here to feel like they, in some way, were partaking in the, the event live. So one of the things we really wanted to do was to make sure that those people who couldn't be here in person could really feel part of the event, part of the occasion. Working with our friends at Crowdcoms, we've created a fully immersive online experience that's also available to in-person delegates through the app. Enabling people to, to have involvement in the session, by, both by partaking in polls and by asking questions through the app, was one way of getting people who weren't able to attend in person to feel like they were there in person. We've created virtual stands for all exhibitors on our platform that enables them to engage with the online delegates, as well as, of course, those in person here at Congress. But a big part of this event is the, is the socializing side of things. So we also built in the opportunity to interview people who may be given a lecture, or our president, or key individuals from the conference center. The quality of the output I've been thrilled by I'm sure we'll try and build something into the future because it provides great opportunities for those people who can't make it. We know that when people don't come, it's not because they don't want to come or it's too expensive to come, it's because the work won't allow them to come because of the need to provide a service. 
So this is one way that we can reach that wider audience. Our partnership with Beaver Congress has meant this world-renowned event has been able to take place even in these COVID times. The team have really embraced this new format and we're really excited about what 2022 might look like in Liverpool. There we go. So that's a, a rough overview of what we did and we'll try to get a bit into the detail of how we did it and uh, certainly what some of the learnings are that we've created. So I'm joined by um, Debs and Joss on stage um, here today. Uh, just wait for a crowd to go wild. No, okay. Um, uh, uh, do you guys want to introduce yourself really quick? Debs, go ahead. Okay, so I'm Debbie and I deal with um, the speakers at Congress. So that was Beaver Speakers in and Speakers actually live in the venue as well. Awesome. And Joss? Yep, yeah, I'm Joss and I basically run the event, everything but the speakers, the commercial exhibition, any contracts, registration, the whole thing. So we're a small team. Small but well formed. <laughs> um, so uh, for, the, for the, those of you in the audience that aren't equine vets, uh, which I assume is most of them, quick pricey of what Beaver Congress is, Joss. Yep, yeah. so uh, Beaver Congress has been running, it'll be 60 years in 2022. Um, uh, and it's uh, an event that runs over three days. We have five concurrent lecture streams running for the duration of the three days and uh, a commercial exhibition where we have about 120 exhibitors. Um, it's our kind of pinnacle of our, our, our year really um, and it's just a great way of um, meeting up with all of the vets um, and it's international so they come from all over the world but mainly kind of Europe. Yeah, I, I used the phrase world renowned in that video I think and that's a fair assessment right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's world renowned. Yeah, about 40% uh, of the delegates that attend do tend to come from overseas so um, yeah, so it is an international conference. It's, it's the biggest equine veterinary conference outside of America. So. Awesome. Okay, so what we're going to try and cover during this uh, with next 30 minutes or so, um, I've, got, I've got a few broad themes that we're going to talk around, right? So we've got planning it, uh, the format of it and what it looked like, the platform, which, uh, w as I mentioned in the video, was our friends Crowdcom, who so were just over the way there, um, registration, and then the live days, and, and then kind of how it, how it was received. So if we start with the, the planning, obviously, so um, I don't think I mentioned in the video, but it was the 5th, 6th, 7th of September, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. which was... <laughs> just in time for um, the release of lockdown. Yes, yeah, so it was definitely one of the uh, first kind of guinea pig events. So um, it was interesting and slightly stressful, but obviously for hybrid events kind of moving forward, hopefully we won't have some of, some of those issues again. Yeah, so, so uh, Debs, give me a, a, a rundown of how the, how the thought process went, because it was it's supposed to be September 20, so it, yeah. then it was January. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk so, me through it. So, so it's annually every September. Um, we knew September 2020 wasn't going to happen because of COVID. So we were like, right, at that point, we'd, we had to cancel it early enough so that speakers hadn't submitted all their abstracts and stuff and hadn't put a load of work into it. So we cancelled it early enough. And we thought, you know what, we'll run it in January. Everything will be fine by then. Obviously, it wasn't. Um, so we then pushed it back to September. Um, so and the, and the first and the first few months of of uh, 2021 were, 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 were still not knowing whether it was going to run in September at all um, so it, we were literally just watching government guidelines the whole time is this conference going to run how are we going to manage it so we had to do something it got to the point where we were like we have to plan now so contact Rich because he'll help us and then that was should we go hybrid or what do we do I think we made a decision relatively early on after the January was postponed that we were going to run something in September regardless of whether it was going to be online or in person because we felt like we wanted to continue it, it's, it was a date in the calendar for for vets for you know almost 60 years we wanted to do something to mark that event so we made a decision that we were definitely going to do something it was just how that was going to work and that's where we got you involved so yeah so we've been we've been working together for, for 10 years next year um wow. so um i think that that um I, if I may say that that helped your your thought process that when we said oh we can help that kind of made you feel a little more comfortable to be honest I, I don't think well for Joss and I especially I don't think we would have been happy going with anybody but you you know you Stop. know our conference you're there anyway filming it um, but you always give us the confidence that it's easy we'll get it done and it always does get done and you always do pull stuff out of the bag so as soon as you went 
we can help you with a hybrid event, I think Joss and I were like, thank goodness we've got Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about pulling stuff out of the bag, right? Yeah. So normally you have 14 months to plan yeah. the yeah. Congress, because yeah. uh, you start planning s just before, before the, the one, that the we're one that, so that you can yeah. announce the date, all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think I worked it out that we had 14 weeks. It was about 14 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. So, uh, and, and my understanding is that, so this was at the ICC in Birmingham, um, and I, my understanding is it was the first large scale event at the and ICC, yeah. and a lot were unfurloughed, ready to, to help produce your event. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, as we say, hopefully none of you guys will have to experience a lot of those kind of teething problems, but um, how, how did that go? So. Actually, um, it was obviously quite stressful in, in terms of the ever-changing um, situation with COVID. But once we kind of had an idea about, okay, we were going to run, the, we were going to run the conference regardless. Um, and Rich, you just assured us that if all went wrong and we weren't able to do any kind of in-person event, we would be able to switch it all on so online. We felt like we were able to start planning. So um, that's where it started. Yeah, I think that's a really good. I, I think that was at the time. I remember this conversation was probably March or something like that when we started talking about actually what it could be. And um, I, I remember saying to you guys, if we plan it for hybrid and we don't want to do virtual, we can undo it. Yeah. And we want to, we we need to undo in person, we can. And I think that's that's very much how ETL was last year actually that we planned for hybrid, but then it got pulled at the last minute. In the, this was supposed to be November. Um, and so I, th I think that was the right way to do it. And like, like, like all our event planner colleagues here in the room and watching at home, that's what, that's what event organizers do, right? They plan for every eventuality, and that's pretty much what we did. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think that we made an assumption that, that particularly for our interna international contingency, it was very unlikely that they were going to be able to attend. But we really wanted to, if we could, to, to be able to be there in person for for those who who could attend because um, the face to face is you know it's kind of what people were really missing out on so yeah and i think um, I, I, I think that leads me nicely to ask you what you were what you were hoping to get out of a hybrid version of Viva congress i guess you'd spoken to the mem obviously the most important people for you guys are membership right yeah. and keeping them happy obviously you've got world renowned speakers that need a lot of <laughs> keeping happy mm -hmm. but um yeah it's the membership right that you made so what what were you trying to what what was a win for you guys out of this basically i think it was just making sure that um those that wanted to be there in some way shape or far, form were able to do that and from the kind of virtual perspective trying to make them feel part of the conference even if they couldn't be there in person we wanted it to have kind of a, a nice, you know, we're, we're, no, we're known for being kind of a friendly bunch, like to socialize. So it was trying to make it quite informal um, and relaxed and um, feeling like they were part of the event. But uh, equally, we wanted them to feel like they would want to come back in person at some stage yeah. if they could as well. So it was kind of trying to get that balance. That of balance like was the, quite tricky, actually. Yeah. We, we wanted to do a little bit of a fear of missing out for people that weren't there so that they would really want to come because it looks really good fun. And I think having the studio in the exhibition hall was really good for that because they could hear the buzz that was going on and yeah. and they could kind of see a bit more about what Congress is about rather than it just being lecture after lecture after lecture. They could actually see the event. Yeah, sure. Well. So, um, so, so for those of you that are here in the room, you will have noticed that we have stolen the ideas that we had at Beaver Congress and we've applied them here. So just the other side of um, the four wall stand right there is the first side media stand. And uh, next to that, we have the hybrid stage, the bonus content stage um, that we're producing stuff between sessions, which is working really well, I'm pleased to report. So let's talk about format then. So normally there are five stages at mm -hmm. Beaver Congress. We scaled that down to three that was mainly because of social distancing right and that kind of thing yeah well i think yeah. we knew that we weren't going to get the number of delegates um and social distancing at the time we started planning was two meters with a face mask so that really limited the number of delegates that we could have in each hall 
and we knew we weren't going to get as many, so we just had to really scale that down. Yeah, we kind of down. had to make a decision quite early on that that's what we were going to do, and it's the same with like the commercial exhibition. We kind of planned it based on kind of one meter rule, thinking, hoping that that would be an achievable scenario by that point. So yeah, and it was, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. it was. Yeah. Um, so uh, we ended up with what I've written down here as a blended solution of live in-person and remote speaker presentations. So in those, what that means in reality is those three stages that we had at the ICC um, had a combination of people stood at a lectern like this um, yeah. delivering their presentation. But um, the, my, my team, the First Sight Media team, also beamed in some of the speakers that couldn't make it because yeah. they were self-isolating or because whatever. Um, yeah. And that, that meant we pretty much got the full program that we were hoping for. Right. Yeah, I mean, actually, um, based on kind of previous years, we'd normally have about 1,200 delegates. What we did is we, we pretty much had a similar number of delegates, but it was 50-50 between those attending in person and those attending virtually. So we were really pleased with that. And actually, um, we've realized now that actually going forwards, running a hybrid event would be really good for us because there's a much better opportunity because we have an international audience to get to people who wouldn't be able to traditionally come to our conference. So there's definitely an area for growth there. You're jumping ahead to key learnings. But, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Shocking, Joss. Um, but but it's, um, it's also an opportunity to bring in speakers that possibly couldn't come. So a lot of our yeah. speakers you know, are from Australia or America or whatever. So if we would bring them over if we would say, OK, Ben needs to come over from Australia, but he's got like five things to do whilst he's here. If we just wanted him for one lecture, we could go, you know what, we can just beam him in yeah. now yeah. and have him for that one lecture. So Yeah, so you, so you mentioned uh, typically 1,200. I've got stats here. Um, okay. So um, there were 1,436 registrations in total, of which 600 were in person, yeah. physical. So... Um, it looks like if you usually get 1,200, what it looks like from these numbers, I'll run those by you again. So 1,436 total registrants, of which 600 were in person. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like you've just spread. So you've gone up a bit. You've gone up 236 yeah, from yeah. typical standard. But yeah. um, that's just it's just spread, right? So yeah. some of them were in person. Some of them, rather than yeah. everyone having to go to the ICC, mm -hmm. we've yeah. just we've just reached a, a wider audience. And, and that's really important for you guys because of the way that your vets work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we would like in-person delegates, especially from the UK, we would only ever get a set amount of delegates because practices still have to be run, rotors have to be covered and vets generally take it in turns. Well, I went to Congress last year, you can go this year. Yeah. Um, so this way, it meant that somebody could come in person, but those that had to stay at the practice could then just log on in the evening and watch any of the lectures that they'd missed yeah. throughout the day. So it was kind of it was kind of drawing more they people could, yeah, in. Yeah, and they could still be involved even even though they weren't able to attend, mm. you know, physically. So, yeah, we definitely, it, I think it, it spread the word yeah. um, in a better way almost than in previous years. Yeah, so, so there were 10,000 page views on the first day. So yeah. lots of people really <laughs> looking all great. over the site. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's great. So that leads me nicely to the next part of my uh questions which is about um, the, the platform that we use so I've mentioned crowdcoms a couple of times and we actually used we actually converted the crowdcoms website into an app that was available on the iOS and Google Play is it yeah. Google Play yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so that people in person could use the same platform so they were all so the engagement was all working off the same system yeah um, and actually it, w it worked out better in terms of like normally for our event we would have an event app so actually this instead of paying for a separate event app this kind of drew it all together it, it enabled both the virtual and the physical delegates to interact with one another rather than them being separated so that worked really well which I was gonna say worked really well yeah so we so um, I've written here that we co-built the crowdcoms <laughs> uh, platform because we can uh, now HTML code <laughs> yes uh, uh, um, no training was provided, but the, <laughs> the, the ladies can now do HTML code, which is very impressive. Um, and I, I, I wrote that because um, you, you guys, th there's a lot of content, right, Loads. for your stuff. So we Huge had uh, 76 exhibitions stands, yep. um, so the exhibitors. Uh, was, was that the same amount that was physical? Yes, yeah, yeah pretty much. Um, so, so everyone had their own exhibition stand. Um, then there was uh, lots, uh, 72 live streams. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of content through the site. So 
we ended up kind of... And we had a lot of pre-recorded content where we decided from previous years that we, we weren't able, in 2020, we weren't able to run it, but we pre-recorded some of it so that it meant that people didn't miss out on that stuff as well. So it was, there was a huge volume of stuff, yeah. and actually that volume of stuff doesn't just stop at the event it means we can use it for lots of other things not just for marketing and that kind of stuff but we can use that cpd content for years to come on some of the other courses that we run or just allowing our access uh, allowing access to our members for free or if there's something particularly topical we can then kind of go oh we've got we've got access to that we can just pop that up yeah. so yeah so there's been nearly 3,000 hours streamed of that content so far um and it's been up for what two months almost um yeah. so uh yes pretty much so i think um so we, so you, you may have saw you may have seen in the video that we showed um the that we tried to create um the kind of feel of the icc and we we had a kind of cartoony version of the foyer in the ICC so that everybody that had been to Congress in person it felt familiar yeah I mean the ICC is one of the venues we use quite regularly so um, a lot of people are familiar with it even if they have only been for one or two years so we wanted them to feel like they were involved equally we didn't want to just kind of create it exactly as the ICC we wanted the people to feel like oh this is something new so we tried to kind of get a balance and so uh, that, that applied to the, obviously everyone had a virtual, ex every exhibitor had a virtual stand. Uh, there were lots of posters and clinical research sessions that we actually pre-recorded and uploaded there, whether they would have their own stage normally, wouldn't they? But we, yeah. we, gave, them, uh, we gave them all virtually. And the colic symposium, we haven't even mentioned that. There was, uh, th th these ladies didn't even just run a, a virtual version and a physical version. They did another symposium virtually on top of that, the colic symposium. But um, so let's, let's talk a bit about the, the, obviously because of the lead time, I think was, was a big factor here, but because of the lead time, I think the, the platform was probably the most, if I may say painful element of the whole process for you guys. But I think just fair? because of the volume of yeah. stuff that needed to go on there. Yeah. Um, but equally, we would have been uploading some of that information to a, a traditional app anyway. So at least by combining it, uh, the virtual platform with the app, it meant that we were only doing it once rather than duplicating that information. But yeah, yeah I mean, we would normally have a lot, mu lot more time. So um, it was the COVID pressures more than anything else that made that yeah, a little absolutely. bit painful. Mm. Um, but was really e user friendly and easy to upload information and do stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Debbie and I would be the first to admit we, we are not tech savvy <laughs> at all. So when we were thinking about a hybrid event, we were, you know, it was the fear of God in yeah. us, honestly. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, but we were soon, as soon as we'd seen the platform, we were like, okay, this is, we can do this. This yeah. is easy. Okay, we just need to get the content up okay right so actually putting the content on with first sight media was very easy it was just obviously time consuming because of the volume okay so um so uh, one of you guys said something to me earlier when we were just having a quick catch up about this about how um it would have been nice to have planned for the two separate audiences separately yeah. as well as planning for it as one big site um, talk, talk to the audience yeah, about that. Yeah, I think that was you just that said that. Yeah, I, I mean, like I think the thing is, we, we, um, we obviously it was one conference, even though there was two kind of sets of um, user journeys, essentially. Yeah. And I think, um, in high, it, well, not in hindsight, but if we'd had a bit more time, we probably would have planned out the different journeys separately, um, rather than almost planning out the virtual journey and then kind of adding on the, the physicals um, kind of at a later stage so but, but I think it was all time constraints rather than yeah. anything else yeah. so yeah in hindsight if we had kind of had a plan and done some more testing with some of the audience to make sure that they felt that that the way that the navigation worked was useful for them because you know it might work for me but I work very differently to an equine vet we're not vets so they have different brains so yeah and also we're inputting the data onto it so we know how it works and we yeah. know what to expect and we know where to go I a little think. bit too close to it yeah, yeah. so yeah. I think that's it you're having we, somebody we else have some, yeah some some of our council members that could have just jumped on and gone yeah. oh actually I wouldn't do it like that I do it like this but literally the 14 weeks gave us no time yeah. for any of that so oh, having said that you know the the feedback has been excellent yeah, um, been nobody has said um you know this was particularly hard to find or but i just think there were just a few things that we could have 
tweaked to make it easier. And uh, one of the things we had discussed was actually just being able to disseminate that information to the delegates. I think um, because it's new, we just wanted to um, you know, get that information out quite easily. And what we did say is actually perhaps next year when we do it, we'll do kind of a little video to show them how to do it rather than yeah. sending them out emails that they probably won't read. Um, so, you know, just doing simple little things that make their life easier, but also make our life easier. Yes, yeah, so we did quite a lot of documentation, didn't we? Uh, a specific one for speakers, uh, both physical and virtual speakers. Then we had another document for um, exhibitors and how they should submit their content and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, I, I, I think you, again, Joss, you said, um, which is worrying considering I run a video production company, <laughs> that wouldn't it have been good if we created a video to show them how to do it? <laughs> so you'd be pleased to know that all our other clients have videos <laughs> showing people how to do their site. But um, I think um, over communication is something that it's I would key. definitely yeah. Yeah. Pick yeah. up from all that is, yes. I think, Anything the more you, new. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think ETL have been very good at that. They've they've sent out lots of uh, lots of comms about, oh yeah, you're doing this, and don't forget to get this COVID test and that and the other. And I think um, I, I think over communication is definitely one big tip that I would get. And, and think about every different user journey. So you mentioned your virtual audience versus your hybrid audience, but then exhibitors are going to have a different user journey speakers, speakers are going to have a different yeah. virtual speakers will have a different yeah. one um, those that are, um, have submitted their poster will have a different one and mm -hmm. and I think that's really good <coughs> excuse me really good advice from you Debs about maybe getting those different stakeholders getting a kind of a spread of them to just have a go yeah and, and just say can you have yeah. a play with this and see what you think just try it. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and like you say it, it's not to say that it was bad no, but I think it would have just given us confidence if, if we'd been able to give it to people and they would have gone, oh, yeah, brilliant. Because awesome. I think we were, we were still like, we've never done this before. It, 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 is this going to work? Are they going to know what they're doing? I think because our speakers and our delegates come and it's the same system year on year on year, and like just said, you know, it, we've just done our 60th. It's yeah, like, I mean, I think people are creature, creature of habits, new. aren't they? So uh, yeah. they, anything new and they're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah. So, yeah. But, I, but, but I'm going to blame the 14 weeks again. Uh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. I, mean, for, that would I can't believe we did it. I, I love watching that video. <laughs> like, oh my God, we, we looked like we knew what we, we were doing. We, we definitely yeah. have a few more grey hairs, don't yeah. we? Yeah. But I, th I think that's definitely a lesson is leave yourself more than 14 weeks. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. But um, we would never uh, I, I think a site map would have been useful. That's yes, something that yeah. we should have thought of uh, yeah. earlier on and given you a site map and said, yeah. this is how it's going to work. And then we could have kind of built everything around that would, yeah. have, would, have, would, yeah. would have been a simple way to do things. Um, so, okay, let's talk about registration. Um, when we talked a few weeks back uh, about this, um, I think once again, it was Joss that was saying um, that we didn't really get much traction on it until quite late on. Mm -hmm. With people registering, people registered yeah. really I think, late. That's just um, a I think trend. part of that is COVID, mm -hmm. but I also feel like that may be a trend going forward. Just people are just registering later and later for conferences, and especially if they're online, why do they need to register until a week before? So. Um, yeah, it was a bit, bit tricky uh, managing, we, you know, uh, uh, even maybe about two weeks before the event, we weren't sure how many delegates were going to come, whether we were only going to get 100 at that point, you know, so yeah. we did get most of our registrations within the, you know, the two weeks before the event, mm -hmm. so that was tricky to manage because, of course, you have to order your catering and um, yeah. not so difficult for the virtual delegates, but um, definitely for the physical side of things, it was it was a bit more tricky. But I think that is going to be a trend going forward. We found that with a lot of our other courses as well. It's just... Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting to hear if that's what the audience in the room are seeing as well, that late registrations are, are coming, getting some nods, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, I think you're probably right that certainly in the COVID world, particularly if you're offer, offering a hybrid solution, yeah. you're, you're likely to, yeah. people to kind of not have decided what they're going to do until, you know, later than you want them mm -hmm. to. So um, that's definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting learning. Point. Uh, and and mm -hmm. we would traditionally do kind of an early bird rate and, and it would be quite early. And I think we decided, you know, actually the it's early bird work. rate needs to end kind of like three weeks before rather than because we just people weren't going to register people didn't know the climate and that might be different in next year who knows so. <laughs> yeah. yeah um 
Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about the live event itself, okay? Mm -hmm. So the live days, uh, three live show days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've mentioned that there were 10,000 page views on day one. Mm -hmm. um, how did it go? It went really it well. It went really well. Really, really well. Better than we could have expected. Yeah. Um, and yeah. what was really good is because we were obviously running the physical event as well, and that gets very busy, we were, yeah. to start with, we were like, okay, right, um, it's over to you, Rich. <laughs> and, and we didn't actually have to do an awful lot on the day in no. terms of the, 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 high, the virtual event because that literally was your job and you were worrying about whether the speakers had logged in on time and that wasn't, <laughs> that we were like, there you go. <laughs> so that was a huge relief, actually, mm -hmm. because um, I don't, I'm not sure how we would have coped if we were kind of juggling both of the events at the same time. Um, but it went really well, and we've had excellent feedback. Um, and one of the highlights was the studio, I think. Yeah, I did 24,000 steps on day one. Uh, <laughs> oh, well just putting done. that out there. I love um, more than just if, if you do that again, if maybe you could put the, the, the <laughs> stages together yeah, okay. and not down four flights of stairs, I'd be very grateful. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so um, I, th I think we had eight, on st eight, eight of our team on site, and it was, it was, it was, quite, a a, it was quite a big mm. production. Mm. Um, uh, similar in scale to this, I guess, from from a first time media point of view, and uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, the big stress was we we so we tech checked is what we call it yeah. with mm -hmm. with every single virtual speaker. We had them dial into our office um, uh, a few weeks before, yeah. uh, so everyone knew what to expect. We'd, we'd shown them the platform; they they knew what was happening, but still, you, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen until the day. And um, I think um, 90, 99 percent of them. Um, dialed in on time perfectly worked a treat yeah um and uh w w was all good we, we had a couple of um quick mobile phone calls like, yes where are you Log I, on. indeed but i mean because of the because of the because of the amount of people that were speaking in most sessions so most sessions tend to last about 90 minutes don't they and there's yeah. four or five speakers in that time so yeah. where there was one that we couldn't quite get connected in time. We, we, we just, just shuffled the order the around. End. By the end, they were in. Yeah. And then uh, instead of going second, they went third. Yeah. Easy yeah. That. And I, I think that's it. We, we were just like, we could be flexible with that. And that made it easier for you. And it made it easier for us. And it still we looked stressing. seamless. Yeah. It, was, it, it was just perfect. I, obviously, because I deal with the speakers, was really worried about speakers being there, beaming other speakers in. I was like, I'm not techie. I was like, how on earth is this going to work? What's it going to look like? It was seamless. It worked really, really well. And I think, if I may shamelessly plug First Eye Media for a moment, I, I, I think that's part of it. I mentioned that um, event organisers plan for every eventuality, and a good production company will do the same thing. Yeah. And so we had, uh, so we use VMix as our primary platform for dialing people in, but we had Zoom backups on every stage. So mm -hmm. if for whatever reason they couldn't connect in VMix, even though they'd done a tech check and it worked, yeah. uh, we had the Zoom backup going in. So there was that, and. Even then, you could just do it on audio, right? You can just phone in to Zoom yeah, yeah. And, and do it like that. And I think we did that with one. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I, I mean, I, I'm biased. And the fact that we're here, I think it went really, really well. And um, certainly the, the feedback from... Feedback's been fantastic. Feedback's been Absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. It looks really professional, really well done. Um, and we've got content to use for years to come. So... Um, Yes, we're so already using the content, so we have a learning management platform um, where we run our courses through. A lot of that content's already been put on there for other delegates to look at. So, yeah. So you mentioned that the the, the studio was the real um, success there. So for yes. the, for the, I mentioned it; it's just the other side of the the wall there. And uh, for those of you that don't know, so obviously these sessions on the main stage here are roughly 40 minutes long. So there's a 20 minute kind of downtime every hour. So what we've been doing is we've been filling that. Um, we've got the awesome Simon, who is um, our virtual host, who's been hosting all week, if you've seen any of the virtual sessions. And so essentially, we're filling that 20 minutes with content. And like here, we, we're just dragging exhibitors over, um, yeah. or we're getting specialists. But even for you guys, we even scheduled a couple of um, uh, specialists that dialed in and did unique sessions that were oh, only available yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, only available to the people watching that bonus yeah. session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it was, it was. I mean, it was your idea because we were like, "What do we do? And do we just pre-record something?" But the studio worked amazingly well. I think um, it just felt, it just allowed those who are work, uh, who are in virtual, coming in virtually, to 
really see what was going on, to kind of pick up on the atmosphere because you could see people kind of milling around, you could kind of get the hubbub of the exhibition. So I thought that worked really well. That's fantastic. Um, and we got great bonus content, which we could then allow our physical attendees to watch afterwards, but also it allowed the virtual attendees to have something of their own, you know, something that, that people weren't watching at the physical event. So, yeah. So um, uh, the, the, the change in slide behind us will tell you that we've only got five minutes left and there are some questions coming in. So before um, I um, drag Katie back in to uh, ask those for us, let me just ask if you've got one top tip or one key learning for our audience um, each, what would it be, Deb's okay, first? Okay, for me it would be to just have a timeline. So start from the event date and just work backwards and just give ourselves key milestones of this has to be done by then, this has to be done, just to stop us from stressing. But sure. I mean, we've obviously got longer next time, so it's not it's not going to be so bad, but yeah, yeah and timeline would help. I, I would say that, and I would also say um, having, although it's one event, um, making sure that you really map out both um, user journeys differently because yeah. they, they are experiencing completely different um, ways of coming into the conference and the conference is very different for a from a virtual to a physical so it's just allowing us to see kind of how they see it yeah. um, and rather than just kind of putting them all together which we probably did a little bit yeah okay and, and I'm supposed to say my top tip is to use first side media but I'm actually <laughs> gonna say um, my top tip is to um, is to over communicate with everybody individually and, and just tell them loads of stuff, even though if you don't think, and then when you get all those questions that ask the same thing over and over again, you can just say, well, watch the video because we've already produced it or read that document, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. um, thank you very much. So there are some questions. Unfortunately, I can't read them without breaking my neck. That's so okay. um, that's what I'm here for. Casey, come, here. come, come thank and. Thank you very much. Really interesting session. Um, uh, and it's been very popular as well. So I just want to a couple of questions. How did or how will you ensure that a hybrid is effective for all parties? so that people are attending events in person can still network with those who are online and vice versa. I mean, you mentioned it briefly in the video, didn't you, and, and throughout the session, but... Yeah, I think we've particular. covered it quite well, but mm. um, there, just there, Well, there was... Uh, the platform had a functionality, so you could chat to people, whether they were in person or not, because the app would send you a message saying, or oh, so-and-so is want, wanting to chat with you. So there, there was interaction between both virtual and physical, which I think worked quite well. Um, but yeah, we were just, yeah. I don't know and and social as well, um, yeah. the, using the hashtag and that yeah. kind of stuff and, as well. And yeah. allowing people to ask questions in the, ses in the sessions that, from people from home and that kind of stuff, it all kind of helps for people to be engaged. So yeah. um, we really wanted people to kind of, we understand when you're um, attending virtually, that you know you have other things going on. So we wanted to encourage people to, even if they were gonna, um, come and dro drop out for a session that we wanted to really encourage them to come back. So, just in creating yeah. content. At the that was part of the yeah. bonus content, wasn't it? To yeah. try and keep people engaged yeah. and keep people part of it throughout. Yeah. Um, um, and one of the questions I, I think is a really practical question, so I'm going to ask it because I've really, I've really enjoyed the practicality of this session as well and hearing from you both, especially because you've said a couple of times you said to me off stage that you're, you're not the most techie. No, not at all. <laughs> So I think you, you two are, are truly event professional inspiration because you took on a big, big challenge and, you, and you're here today to talk about it. And it's obviously, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. So I think this is, some of the practical questions are great. So tech checks for virtual speakers must be more time consuming. How did you manage this on a large scale events and speakers joining from different time zones? So it was more time consuming. <laughs> it was more time consuming, but it, Rich did all of the tech checks. So first sight media, just, I was a little bit stressed about that and they, Rich being rich went, don't, don't worry about it, just give it to me, I'll sort it out. And yeah, so, so the answer is to done. pass it on so to somebody yeah. else. First <laughs> Sight Media contacted all of the speakers, they had a calendar that they then, they looked at their calendar and went, right, I can tech check on this day at this time. They booked themselves in and just First Sight Media ran with it and then just told yeah, them Yeah, so we used um, Coalander. Okay. Um, to uh, set up a, some, some, some opportunities for people to just connect whenever they wanted. We then sent that out as part of the um, virtual speaker pack um, and they just clicked a link, they then booked their tech check and then one of my guys was, uh, would send them a code uh, an hour or two before and they would just connect in tech check. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's more time consuming, definitely more time consuming. 
but absolutely worth it. It because, made it seamless on the day. Because other, like, like uh, you know, the carpenter's phrase, measure twice, cut once. This mm. is a good example of that, right? So um, don't don't put anything down to chance. Yeah. So it, yeah, it took, it's painful and it takes a bit more time, but totally worth it. And you empowered your speakers to make that, so they sort of put it in their diary, so obviously they could yeah. make sure it was suitable for them rather than you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's good. I love that. Um, would you recommend the online part of a hybrid event being managed by people who are also online? This way it becomes more effective of the online experience. Yeah, I mean, I mean, potentially. I mean, we're a very small team, so um, Debbie and I are really kind of the, the main people running it, so we had to be there for the physical event. But I mean, yeah. I guess if you, had, if you had the manpower to have someone running it online, that would make more sense. Yeah. We did have um, our kind of our techie guy um, at the office. He was able to make sure that like uploads for like people who were registering on the day that kind of all happened. He was on site with us, but he was he kind of in the back me. office somewhere. So um, it meant that he could kind of concentrate on that. So we kind of we kind of did have with, um, someone. We had Sarah um, running the um, yes. the bonus cut stage as well, and she she was getting tweets and she was looking yeah. at the at the Crowdcoms platform and and engaging with what was being said there a lot as well. So that worked really well too. Yeah, yeah. Fab, unfortunately that's what we've got time for. Um, but thank you very much, Debbie, Joss, thank Rich, thank you.